Good afternoon. Um, this afternoon, I'm going to be talking about formal and informal translation and interpretation for immigrants and asylum seekers, and I'm going to give you my first disclaimer. The term immigrant and asylum seekers I don't really like because I don't know what an immigrant is. I may be an immigrant. I've lived here eight and a half years. I have no idea if that's what I am. The reason I'm using the word immigrant and asylum seekers is that those are the terms that are being used in the official capacity. So that's how come I'm choosing that. This is my first disclaimer. The second disclaimer um, that I will basically give is um, I am a foreigner. You can tell by my accent I'm American and proud of it. Um, my last name is pronounced Lindsay because my grandparent, my father was a native German speaker and they were not allowed to use the German pronunciation of Linza because everybody would discriminate against them. And so my personal connection to this topic is my family felt that everyone should be bilingual. They threw us in a station wagon and moved us to Mexico when we were growing up. Um, and that sort of how come I came to this topic. And I believe in this not just professionally, but personally. So that's sort of the big disclaimers. The other thing that I want to do right at the, the onset is the person who was involved with conducting this research with me um, is Dr. Oscar Bladis Marti, and he is sitting right there from Queen's University. The ne is there a clicker? Oh, this is nice. Um, Northern Ireland has recently become far more culturally and linguistically diverse. And what's interesting about this new level of diversity is many people, as you say, it's becoming more diverse, not less, but many people don't see it. Many people don't hear it. Um, and I am looking at, we are looking at linguistic diversity as something wonderful. Um, and so it's very nice to be able to follow on the previous presentation because we have the same sort of positive attitude towards linguistic diversity. Um, what is, and again, if I, okay, let's just. During the troubles, it was not, Northern Ireland was not a sought after destination for international individuals and immigrants. Um, and I think that that's an important, the perception of Northern Ireland still doesn't have the most positive perception. And the newcomer population has grown tremendously and I'll define newcomer in a moment. There were just over 2,000 newcomer learners in 2004 to 2005 that went up to 11,565 learners in 2014-2015. And newcomers, now this is a really important distinction of the term. And one of my soapboxes, I have many soapboxes, but this is one of my soapboxes. Newcomers have arrived, newcomer learners are not are learners who do not possess enough English to learn through the medium of English without support. Now, we have a nasty term in the United States, absolutely nasty, and that is English learners. Those are now, and they're also called English language learners. Now, the reason that I feel that's a nasty term is that it completely discounts the fact that kids come to school with a language and linguistic repertoire. It basically says, you've come here, you've got to learn English, you're an English learner. What about all that language I learned at home? Doesn't count. So the term newcomer is much more encompassing and has a much more positive attitude towards linguistic diversity than English learner. There are other things about English learner which I'm not going to get into being a foreigner. Um, and what it, 
I'm going to be talking about in the next few minutes are linguistic capital, linguistic diversity, linguistic equality, linguistic equity, linguistic discrimination, linguistic barrier, homeschool communication, and the findings. To give you an overall preview of what the findings are is basically translation and interpretation needs to be embedded in a positive attitude towards linguistic diversity and linguistic equity. That just saying we're going to have someone put the words of the other language in place, that's not what works. What we did is we looked at what is effective and it has to be this whole attitude towards linguistic diversity and linguistic equity and I'll explain that more a little bit later. Um, linguistic capital is really important. Linguistic capital, this is Bordeaux's um, capital, is the linguistic knowledge you possess, the languages you speak. Now, what I will say to people often is, do you want one bank account or do you want two bank accounts? Everybody responds, of course, two bank accounts. Well, it's similar with linguistic capital. And if we don't keep up the home language, we are throwing away linguistic capital. It's like throwing money away. Now, people want to save the red squirrels. That's nice. People want to be environmentally savvy. That's nice. In my will, no money goes to red squirrels or red spotted owls, no. It goes to languages are living and breathing entities they can become extinct just as red squirrels and red spotted owls. And if we don't safeguard the languages, we are throwing away linguistic capital. Linguistic diversity refers to individuals who possess linguistic capital in a variety of home languages. And this should be viewed, and I'll be explaining this a little bit more, in a positive way. It shouldn't be problematized. Um, it can be difficult to address, but not insurmountable when individuals communicate and not necessarily with the same language. And unfortunately, words like barrier make it, turn it into a problem rather than words like capital that look at it as a resource and a positive aspect, attribute. Um, language barrier, ooh, so many people use it that I couldn't, is that when people don't have a common language or means to communicate, what is important about the research is there are ways around it. Linguistic equality, we cannot have everything in every single language published for all the 90 languages. That's not possible in Northern Ireland. Every document, every interaction, it can't be. However, linguistic equity can be achieved. Lingui linguistic equity requires all individuals who speak different languages to be treated with respect and consideration of their linguistic rights. And it's a really important distinction between equality and equity. People say, oh, we can't do the equality, so we can't do anything. No, you can uh, look for equity. Linguistic discrimination still happens. It occurs when someone is discriminated against because they do not possess linguistic skills in a specific language, often English. It's still acceptable to say, they don't speak English yet. What is their problem? They don't speak English. They've been here for, you sort of go, well, how well do you speak other languages? And this attitude towards linguistic diversity, other aspects of diversity, People would never say anything negative, but this is acceptable. I don't think it's acceptable. And homeschool communication is collaboration 
between schools and families, and it benefits children. So then you've got linguistic diversity. How are you going to deal with it when families don't speak English and schools don't speak all the other languages and there's a need for translation and interpretation? What are you going to do? Well, what we did is we were sponsored by the Inclusion and Diversity Service of Northern Ireland and the overall research project was what are the best ways to connect schools, newcomer families with schools. And what we found was that the ethos, a positive ethos towards linguistic diversity is what worked in looking for best practices. Now, I will also tell another one of my secrets. I started this world as a kindergarten teacher. So I am very bilingual kindergarten teacher. So I have a lot of great things to say about language teachers. And when we were looking at the practices that were being used for homeschool communication, they had been developed by language teachers. And so following on the previous presentation, I don't think it's an accident that they came up with some very successful practices. What we did is we looked at, uh, we had face-to-face semi-structured interviews with 30 newcomer parents and 58 school staff in Northern Ireland. And we really wanted to look at members of staff in a larger percentage because we wanted to say, how do you make it work? How, what are you doing that is making it work? Those of us who have been in situations where we don't speak the lingua franca, we learn how to survive. How do we get to the other part where there are, where it works and the other people have made the appropriate accommodations? And one of the things that we did is we felt very strongly that we wanted to use innovative methodology so that throughout the research project, we weren't just translating verbatim the research instruments, because we felt that that wasn't going to really be sufficient, because it wasn't, as what Peter was saying, it wasn't going to make sure that we got the essence of the research project. So what we looked at, the first thing that we did is we looked at, we wanted to make sure that all the items were clear and we worked with the Inclusion and Diversity Service to make sure that we used plain English. And we also looked at um, questions to make sure that they were, again, this whole notion of plain English um, permeated throughout the project because it's easier, it's harder to, commute, to translate something if it's unclear and muddled. So you can see um, the first one is, it doesn't have to necessarily be shorter. What are your plans for half term? We didn't know what half term was. Half term is a really good example of something that was like half term. Okay, what is this? Um, what are your plans for the October holidays or school vacation? Now, which one is clearer and easier to understand? The first one or the second one? First one, there's a, pardon? The second one has, a pair, has two words, holidays, school vacation, that makes it clear, and using or, that makes it a little bit clearer as far as when you use or or and, it's like, oh, I don't understand the first word, I can go to the second word. The next one is, and we were looking at, um, what we've also done is looked at a lot of homeschool communication in another project where we looked at the language in sentences to make sure that they are as clear and unambiguous as possible. What are your intentions with regard to residing in Northern Ireland? Or 
Or how long will you stay in Northern Ireland? Which is easier? Second one. So we really, what brought you to Northern Ireland? Did you come by plane or train or bus? Why did you come to Northern Ireland? So we spent a lot of time really making sure that the questions were as clear as possible. We also used two types of professionals as interpreters. And um, basically, we used professionally certified interpreters as well as bilingual school staff. And in both cases, and I'll talk a little bit more about the advantage of these, and then the interview guide was piloted with bilingual participants, fully proficient bilingual participants, who were able to make sure that it was valid across cultures without having to be mediated through an interpreter or a translator. And so we really felt very strongly that if we were promoting an ethos of linguistic equity, that throughout the research project process, we needed to make sure that that came through. And one of the things that was important was the translation and interpretation was key, but it was an embedded in an ethos of linguistic equity. This is really important. A few years ago, one of my international students, we were breaking into Stranmellis, long story, and she broke her foot, all right? And we ended up at the Royal Victoria Hospital, and there was a great big sign on the sign with all sorts of little pushpin holes in it, and it was Caddy Wampus, and it said, do you have a language problem? Do you speak this language, this language, this language, or this language? And it didn't even have the words in those languages. Do you speak French? Do you have a language problem? And that just, oh, I was raging. I wish I had a phone with a picture at that point. I was so angry. What we found was that this, in the schools who feel they're doing best practices to link homeschool, translation and interpretation was considered a matter of course. It was not a problem. It was something that just happens. And the respect and accommodation for language diversity emerged as the overall theme. It wasn't offered as a problem. The schools acknowledge, and this is one of the best um, I wish my Spanish was as, a fraction as good as their English. So it was a very positive attitude. Now, this next one, I don't know if any of you are familiar with linguistic landscape research where it looks at the signs in other languages. And the schools, as part of, again, if you're looking at translation and interpretation, it has to be contextualized. And schools posted signs in learners' home language. Basically, part of it was for information, and part of it also was a positive acknowledgement of diversity. Now, one thing that I tell people, there are grammar schools that have signs on the outside in a language other than English throughout Belfast, and what language do you think that is? Latin. It's not an acknowledgment of diversity. These are an acknowledgment of diversity. And it's a very significant symbolic. I mean, you look at flags, but you also can look at languages. Schools also presented welcome, prepared welcome books for cultures. And they work with the Inclusion and Diversity Service, again, to make sure that things were written in plain English. And when I went down to the ladies' room today, I noticed in this building, plain English was not observed. It was disabled toilet, no international wheelchair sign. And then there was another sign that said, only authorized users are permitted beyond this door. What? So that's the contrary to um, things written in plain English. They also had, which was really interesting, names and roles of staff member, members with photographs. Now this 
people have said, we may have Miss McBride, Miss McThis, Miss McThat, Miss Mc... And if you've got seven names, Miss O. Boyle, Miss O. It can be very difficult to learn the new names and having those in photographic form with the caption below is incredibly useful. Schedules and calendars, all of that is information which was chosen and templated based on the experiences of people from different cultures. In one school, they even had a focus group with kids and parents to say, what do you want to do to make the welcome book better? And we also looked at both formal and informal translation were utilized by families. And it's sort of like getting your head out of the sand so that there is a school staff member, a parent, and an interpreter and translator. So these are people that talk with one another. Now, informal translation and interpretation, a little bit problematic, but it's often when, when families first showed up at schools, they often went with a neighbor, a relative, a work colleague, and they showed up with their translator in tow. Now, on the one hand, because the family chose this person, you know, the schools would say, well, we'll respect it. But on the other hand, you don't have adherence to the rules of professional translation. But it's a real awkward situation because on the one hand, the parents feel comfortable with the individual, but on the other hand, there are some problems with it. So you have to mediate. What's more important here is that the school said, we recognize the importance of translation and interpretation, and they introduced the services that the school provides for translation and interpretation, and basically sort of, not necessarily wean, but often wean them to the professional services, and made it as such a standard part of the procedure. And I think that's what's really important is the respect for it. Um, we also have formal interpretation and professional translators. And the advantage is they can translate content accurately if they do not have specific content expertise. This is really important. In every realm and situation, translation and interpretation isn't automatic. Think about if you've ever been to um, the doctors and you feel like, oh my, I have no idea what they're talking about. Or a solicitor who's speaking legalese. So that's where it's problematic to have someone who isn't a professional translator. The other area where I like to put this in professional translation because they do adhere to the confidentiality and all these others is bilingual school staff and bilingual members of staff of schools are excellent because they do understand the context. They do have to adhere as teachers, as members of school staff to all the regulations of confidentiality. So although they're not quote unquote qualified translators, they have the contextual knowledge necessary to provide a good quality translation. The other thing that we found in one school in particular, which I think is really important, is that the bilingual member of staff had a cell phone and the parents never abused it. They realized that there was someone with whom they could communicate at any time in case of emergency. And again, the entire acceptance of translation and interpretation is what is so important. The next is, again, I'm repeating myself intentionally, is promote a spirit of linguistic equity. And I personally feel that if you pro provide things in a way that 
It's never referred to as a problem, but always as an asset. And if you can really try to make it as easy to translate and interpret as possible, and that is providing content, and we have an article on plain English, um, that is understandable, then you are more likely to make, facilitate interpretation and translation. Again, do whatever you can to make it easy to translate and interpret the content. And it has to do with attitudes and it has to do with the language actually presented. And one final thing about plain English, plain English is mandated in many places in the UK and the US because legalese has overwhelmed so many quote unquote native English speakers. So these two sort of recurrent themes of attitude and clarity of language are what we feel will facilitate interpretation and translation. And we also feel very strongly that whenever appropriate, hire bilingual staff with the requisite professional background and training. Now, this is, oh, I have so many soapboxes. I might as well get on one more before I close. Um, we have many teachers in Northern Ireland, fully qualified teachers in their home countries, who are working as classroom assistants. And these are individuals who are fully bilingual, perfectly qualified to translate and interpret because they have the skills in their home language and whenever possible to utilize these individuals. Um, and I feel that when these individuals, the number of contexts where I've seen these individuals working, at first there's a little bit of pushback. Oh, they're from X, they're from Y. They're outstanding. They're wonderful at what they do. Um, and so in that particular group, when I'm endorsing fully certified and licensed translators and interpreters, I include those fully qualified professionals as well. And I think that's it. That's it. Thank you very much.